It finally happened! Booster 7 has just become the most powerful active rocket in the world, firing up a record 14 of its 33 Raptor engines. And I've gotta say, it's been worth the several month long wait. Just absolutely amazing. This is one big step closer to making history because during this test, SpaceX used the full nitrogen and water suppression system on the pad, providing a crucial data point on the quality of this vital safety system at the pad. But according to some sources, concrete chunks were falling to the ground shortly after the test. This was around 40% of the total power output. A mix of debris types also fell during the test. While a bit unnerving, it is a big deal. So let's analyze all of this in today's episode of Falfa Tech. Powered by 33 upgraded Raptor 2 engines that SpaceX says can produce up to 230 tons each, Super Heavy could have produced up to 3,220 tons of thrust when it ignited 14 of its engines earlier today. That likely means that Starship is now the fourth most powerful rocket ever tested, slotting in above NASA's space shuttle but below the Soviet inertia. And even if all 14 engines never throttled above 73%, SpaceX's Starship booster likely still produced more thrust than any other active rocket in the world, beating Falcon Heavy, which is mind-blowing. Notably, only 14 out of 33 engines were tested, yet we got a dust cloud engulfing the entire launch tower. In fact, that is not dust. That is pulverized concrete or concrete fire spalling and that is a problem let's go back in time to november of 2020 when the rocket company spacex was just starting to make some progress in the starship testing program one of the prototypes serial number eight was on the pad to test fire the engines for the very first time as a fully stacked vehicle Almost as soon as the engine lit up, it was clear that something was wrong. A shower of sparks exploded into the dusky sky, and the engine abruptly stopped. The sparks looked innocuous at a distance without a reference for scale, but in reality, they consisted of massive glowing chunks of the launch pad below the rocket. One of these chunks was blasted into the engine bay, severing an essential cable and severely damaging the rocket. The event brought into the spotlight what is probably the most humble piece of engineering in the entire rocket industry, the pad. Indeed, when a launch or landing pad fails, it can be worse than if it wasn't there at all, creating high-speed projectiles that jeopardize the safety of the vehicle and its support equipment, not to mention its crew. In preparation for the latest test of B-7, SpaceX teams had installed shielding on the orbital launch mount legs and also tested the fire suppression system. These static fires are as much to test stage zero as the booster. Luckily, nothing caught fire. Starship Gazer took some pictures of the orbital launch mount after the epic 14 engine static fire, and it also looks fine. However, as mentioned before, there are visible things that got blasted away. Let's imagine when they do a 33 engine test. I fear this thing is going to either carve a hole in the ground or many engines would fail. Hopefully, the SpaceX team can control this. They are building up for an eventual 33 engine static fire and ultimately an orbital flight test target it for this December. While Starship has just won its prestigious crown, if NASA has its way, Starship could hold it for less than 36 hours. This is because, as early as 104 AM EDT or 604 UTC on November 16th, a little over 35 hours after SpaceX's record-breaking Starship static fire, NASA will attempt to launch its massive Space Launch System rocket for the third time since late August. And as the saying goes, third time's the charm. Hopefully. In any case, mission managers met on Monday, November 14th to discuss the flight readiness of the Artemis 1 Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft following slight damage caused by Hurricane Nicole, which was swiftly downgraded to a tropical storm after making landfall on Thursday, November 10th. 
Despite the fact that a band of insulating caulking on Orion was damaged by high winds during the storm's landfall, Mike Serafin, Artemis mission manager at NASA headquarters in Washington, said, There is no change in our plan to attempt to launch on the 16th, during a media teleconference today on November 14th. The unanimous recommendation for the team was that we were in a good position to go ahead and proceed with a launch countdown, added Jeremy Parsons, deputy manager of NASA's Exploration Ground Systems Program at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Florida. Now, the launch team will begin pumping 750,000 gallons of super cold liquid oxygen and hydrogen fuel back into the huge rocket's tanks starting just before 4 p.m. Tuesday using revised Kindler Gentler techniques to control temperatures and minimize sharp pressure jumps to prevent leaks in critical seals. And if any problems do show up, engineers will have two hours to resolve them before the launch window closes. But the weather is 90 percent go, and if the fueling procedures work as intended, the 322-foot-tall Space Launch System rockets four shuttle main engines and extended strap-on solid fuel boosters should finally roar to life at 1.04 a.m. Wednesday, opening a new era in American spaceflight. Briefly turning night into day as it climbs away atop 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, the 5.7 million pound SLS will quickly accelerate as it consumes propellants and loses weight, passing through the speed of sound in less than a minute. This will overtake Super Heavy B-7, but also make it the second most powerful launch vehicle in the history of spaceflight after the Soviet N-1. N-1 never succeeded, however, so SLS could become the most powerful rocket ever to reach orbit if its first launch is successful. Meanwhile, the two strap-on boosters, which provide the lion's share of the rocket's initial thrust, will burn out and fall away about 2 minutes and 10 seconds after liftoff. The four hydrogen-fueled engines powering the core stage will shut down 6 minutes later, putting the Orion capsule and the SLS second stage into an initial elliptical orbit. After raising the low point of the orbit, the single engine powering the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, will fire again about 90 minutes after launch to break out of Earth orbit and head for the moon. The Orion capsule and its service module will separate a few minutes later to continue the rest of the trip on their own. The goal of the Artemis 1 mission is to send the Orion spacecraft on a looping trajectory beyond the moon in a critical test of the vehicle's propulsion, navigation, and solar power systems before returning to Earth for a 5,000 degree re-entry and splash down in the Pacific west of San Diego. Pop quiz! 5,000 degrees F or C? Write your answer in the comment section down below. Now, if the Artemis 1 flight goes well, NASA plans to launch four astronauts atop a second SLS for a lunar shakedown mission, Artemis 2, in late 2024, followed by an astronaut landing mission in the 2025-26 to timeframe. But that assumes the Artemis 1 flight goes well. As Jim Free, Director of Exploration Systems at NASA headquarters put it Friday, we're never going to get Artemis 2 if Artemis 1 isn't successful. Very eloquently put, Mr. Free. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and please share your thoughts in the comment section down below. Your support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, we thank you so much, and we hope to see you again next time.